Hey, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with the great Howie Weinberg. How are you, my friend? Same shit, different day. <laughs> yeah. Which, I was just better day then. I was admiring your uh, um, <laughs> don't live in New York anymore tan here. Well, you know what it is. It's, it's just a, a, a matter of uh, you've, you've conquered one city and I grew up there my whole life. I've done everything you could possibly do. I've mastered a few hundred gold records. I've done thousands of records there. and. I, I got a I got a, a, an opportunity to move out here and and I just flourished. It's great. I found the most amazing studio in Laurel Canyon, down the street from me. Down the street from Warren. I mean, who the thunk? I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> and not only that, but um, you know, we have a lot of fr mutual friends and yep. we're mutual admiration. So I think he's a fantastic mixer and engineer, and I hope he's. I hope you think I'm the same. Thing. Absolutely, we're here oh, well. because we're big fans. <laughs> And it's like, great. It's like, fucking, let's do it, you know? <laughs> so here we are, okay? And um, Look, so look, for those, you know, mastering is like the, the black arts to most people. Well, I call it the white arts. But the white okay. arts, okay. <laughs> so g give us a little, I mean, how, okay. how do you end up as a mastering engineer? Well, I was just by accident, of course, you know? I mean, I was just, um, I was, a, I was a, uh, Master Disc was a company that kind of got started by accident with Bob Ludwig and and a couple other engineers in New York in the, in the late 70s. And a friend of mine who I knew for years was, um, had something to do with the, the space and the studio. And it was, it was all just completely 100% vinyl medium. Cassettes were showing up a little bit. There were eight tracks then. And, and you know, so the, the, the preferred medium was obviously quarter inch tape, dull bead or not dull bead and digital wasn't even digital was something that somebody thought about mm, that could be interesting digital i don't know about that ah! but um you know it was a whole analog world and it was and you you had to you had to take something um and for 35 minutes or 40 minutes you would have to from one end to another just do all your moves in a row okay change eqs change levels, settings and everything, bam, 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 bam. And, and it would have to be perfect and then you'd be cutting a lacquer at the same time. And if all goes well, if it doesn't skip or overcut, you got yourself a, you know, you got yourself a master. And of course the plant could ruin it the next day so you'd have to go do it again. There was no such thing as automation. There was no such thing. It was all, everything was manual. But the point being is that everything was analog and you know, when I go back and listen to the shit I did, or the shit that was done in the late eight, you know, late late seventies, early eight, mid eighties, it just it it, it 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 sounded it sounded real. I'm not that stuff doesn't sound real now, but you didn't know any better, and and I think there was more engineering skills now than then than there was there is now in terms of um, getting things right first time out. You know, now everything is just cut and paste, cut and paste. Let's do it again. You know. You know, you know what I mean, the whole... I do. Do you think, what's one of the biggest changes? Because what I love about your work is you've got yeah. a lot of really great low end. And well, it that feels was a, really, yeah. really good. That caused me a lot of problems in the old days. I was about, that's why I was over going. cutting, because I basically, you know, I was, I'd like to think I was one of the inventors of hip hop. I did the first hip hop platinum record, first hip hop gold record. What records were those? The Curtis Blow, The Breaks, Grandmaster Flash, The Message, and White Lines, and all those stuff in the... White Lines is such an amazing track. Yeah, and I did it all, and, and oh yeah, those are all my boys, and and I was the uh, you know I was the I was the I was the guy because it, it, at first I got involved with with Russell Simmons who just was like a manager and he just said everybody just started he's just sent me this stuff and and it became an old place. I was the guy to send the stuff to whatever it is I made things pop and and a lot of times that you know the the great thing about what I do is. Sometimes I take credit for absolutely nothing. All I do is push play and fuck. But then again, sometimes I take credit for like pretty much, you know, retweaking everything. Like you're turning every knob in the book and getting it to sound right. That's the skill though, isn't it? Knowing when to do it and when skill. not to do it. Well, I, I've always heard, you know, worked on the, uh, on the fact that I could have 500 buttons here, but only four really work well mm -hmm. or six maybe. You know? And then if you're lucky, Eight, and if you turn ten knobs, well, you know the the, the guy missed something. But those were days where uh, people put in a lot of hours in control rooms, and and analog tape sometimes wasn't as you know if you really if you go back to analog versus digital, yeah, you know a lot of people really they embraced digital because 
they would they would they would push you know a playback and it would be kind of similar what they had you know the the analog days of the, oh shit that the, the azimuth was off on the tape machine the bias sucked that's a bad batch of tape and i know some very famous engineers and producers that 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 just embraced digital as soon as it came out cuz it's like hey you know I, there's no there's no gray areas you, you know even though it, 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 the first digital you know, uh, systems were lacking a lot of bottom and a lot of depth and everything, but they did still sound closer to what you were recording. Close to what you were recording. Yeah, we used to sit there and boost the top end. Yeah, of course. Going on the tape, so it would come back the way we wanted. Absolutely, and and I believe me, I'm the guy who boosted that top end. Yeah. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And but in those days, it was, it, the record business was more of an art of getting something to sound really good on vinyl. The whole when I first started, the 12 inch. Uh, you know, single market was humongous. You could, you know, bands didn't even put out records. They would, they, they could, you could do a 12 inch single for 10 grand, sell 150,000 of them. So, I mean, you know, that, that's, you know, that's unheard of these days, but now revenue streams are obviously different. But in those days, you could, a $5,000 investment, you get a band, you do So you could get like a five or 10 minute mix on a 12 inch, but you could get wider, Cuts. Oh yeah, of course. So it would be twelve inch, forty five RPM, or yeah. or thirty three, and yeah, you could you could you could make shit fucking fly. You could get some real great low end. And that's when guys in these big clubs, you know, I, I knew the New York clubs, you know, I, I I did all those twelve inch records, and you put them on, and uh, and uh, uh, they sound amazing. And to this day, I swear to God, I listen back to these old twelve inch records I've done, and uh, God damn it, they sound great. Not that stuff doesn't sound great now, just in a different great. You know. Yeah, we. I think that's something we we forget. You know, oh, you, you buy a, really, yeah. you buy a seven inch, and you know, if it was a five minute song, then you were you were losing your low end. You can, but you know, we. I had all these tricks. What were yeah. your tricks? How were you able to push it a little bit more? You know, just maybe maybe get the level up, but there's a possibility it might overcut, it might skip. But it sounded great, and you know, as as we're going back to the age of vinyl, I mean, this is going back a long way, and I remember everything. The one good thing about what I do is, I don't know about you, but I pretty much remember every. I I could almost remember every session I've ever done. Right. You know, and I because probably everyone, when it comes to music, it's, it, it's what I, we, what I we have live this, for. I have this it? piece of my brain, uh, the the hard drive that I just I can remember. And some of these were, were pretty impressive, I have to say. And I goddamn wish there were digital cameras around at the time or like something to actually even, you know, archive any of this. But it's all in here. And uh, um, it's all good. But but those are the days I was, I was, there, was there are some guys that would always take a picture. They, you know, even back in the 60s. I have some. No, 60s, I don't. I have, I have, I have 80s, some pictures. And then people send me stuff that I remember. But... um. Getting getting back to sounds of the eighties, it was you know it was basically it was all vinyl and a tracks were still kind of d you know delving in a little bit here and I remember the first. Do you know how a tracks are made? I don't, but I listened They're to a tracks, tracks as a kid. So that you'd have four quarter inch reels of tape, and each one, uh, each one had a a, um, a program, and God be known if the program doesn't fit. The, the point you have to do a fade out and a fade in so you can imagine an artist going i'll just fade your song right in the middle you don't mind or we try to like get the artist to uh, uh approve a fade somewhere in the middle of a song <laughs> and half the time they just did it and they didn't you know i guess nobody even listened so they didn't care well there were some songs i seem to remember on eight tracks when i was a kid that were too long yeah, exactly so they, yeah they'd have to like they'd go into the next out. block of four <laughs> well, they'd have to fade it out, and they would fade it in. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that artistic freedom. Uh, I mean, nowadays you'd get killed. Yeah. Well, you'd get killed then, but I think there was no choice. And then cassettes were finally coming out, and they were cool, kind of cool. I, I dug because I had I had the first Walkman. Do I don't know if you remember those things? Of course. It was like this gigantic thing, and it, like <laughs> you could put a tape in. And the good thing about cassettes were they're indestructible, and, and the, you know. And you could put them on your dashboard, go to the beach, put it back in, put it in your car. It, 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 and the medium was good enough. I it was mean, good enough. Look, have you heard MP3s these days? I mean, I yeah. think cassettes blow them away. And another funny story is I have a, an old BMW that uh, when I bought it, I was like, damn, there's a cassette player in there. 
<laughs> so what I did is I, I went to um, the local crazy you know, at a thrift shop in somewhere in Santa Monica, and the guy had walls of cassettes. Probably for about 50 cents. Yeah, 50 cents a pop. And I bought like 30 or 40 gigantic big hit records. And I, I, as soon as I popped it in, I went, oh, I can hear sound again. It's all analog, 100% analog. The recordings are analog. They, they were quite good. I, I invite my friends into the car, go, check this out, you know, <laughs> a cassette. <laughs> That's funny. I know, it, it, some of them sounded really good. I, God's honest truth. But, you know, that's just, uh, you know, a, a funny part of a... Uh, so, you, so, do you remember the CD kind of revolution? How did that affect That was like, it changed my life. How did it change it? Well, because like, you know, you're cutting vinyl, you know, you, you know people are giving you records... You know, they're analog recordings, and they've they got some big fucking punchy-ass bottom. They got some smooth-ass top, really nice mid-range. And I don't know if you know what vinyl cutters do to that. It just, it wrecks it. It can. The bottom end, you can't get anything under 50, 60 hertz, or else the thing's overcut. If it's too bright, it smears everything. You got to limit the high frequencies a lot like crazy. The mid-range sometimes gets, get, gets, gets a little crunchy. You know, the, it's an interesting subject because I've been trying to explain to people about vinyl uh, because a lot of people are buying vinyl vinyl players, but they're not going into phono inputs on receivers where, which had an RIAA curve, which compensated oh, that was, for it. Yeah, okay. So they're not hearing the vinyl like we used to hear it. Oh, well, first of all, vinyl records today. I mean, I, I have a 16-year-old daughter. God bless her. She loves music. And she you know, heard vinyl records are pretty cool. So there was an old player, all in one player I had in my house, correct? She, she can't figure out how to turn the thing on. She goes, Daddy, where's the play button? I put a record on, there's no play button anywhere. <laughs> and so, the, so she said, lift that thing up and put it down. And you go, <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> but the point being is analog records were, an, were analog, okay? Nowadays, vinyl records are, I hate to say this, but they're basically bad sounding CDs because... You have to really, you have to change the sound a bit to get it to, to cut properly. It's just a medium that, that really, that kind of, uh, God be known to me, showed up again because people really love the, the uh, they love touching the music. Sure. You know, I mean, that 12 inch cover is amazing. You the cover. Open it up, the artwork, yeah, the yeah. credit list, you yeah, get yeah. to know who worked on it. You You're like, who's Howie Weinberg in New York? Oh, yeah. Going, well, I wonder where he is. <laughs> well, that, that's how I, that's how everybody knew me, those big ass covers. And you can touch it, you feel the grooves, you know, and you throw it on there and you put yeah. it down. It, it's I like, love the, it's sort of the, the like a, a, a ritual. You get it out and you hold it by the edges right. and you flip it over and right. put it on. But the, the point being is when vinyl kind of got, a little yeah, bit. CDs are coming in. Well, the problem is the vinyl manufacturing sucked. A lot of times you get records that would go like wobbly. And, right. Um, and it, 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 it seemed like recordings were getting even better. People were really paying a lot of attention to really, you know, not that they weren't in the 70s, but the techniques were getting really good. The big SSL consoles were coming in, big, big Neve consoles. They were automated. The recordings were getting fabulous. And what the problem was, the worst thing you can happen is you, you, you get a beautiful sounding, you know, uh, record that, that's well mixed, well recorded, and then you try to get it on a shitty piece of vinyl and you, you get the test pressing back. And because I, a lot of times I'd have to check the test pressing and they go, I don't know, this didn't sound right to me. And I put it on and like, oh, yeah, the high end is missing. They scrub, you know, they, um, um, you know, when they make stampers, there's a whole procedure to manufacturing records where you have to make a stamper and then you have to buff the stamper sometimes and then you have to go back. And if you're using shitty, uh, uh, you know, shitty um, vinyl or whatever it is, a lot of times, don't get me wrong, they, they had this thing called regrind. I don't know if you know what that was. Basically, a lot of the records that didn't sell, they would, uh -huh. it's like, well, now it's called recycle. They would take it with the labels on and just, make a dust out of it, powder out of it, and make molds again. With the label. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is what it was, but, um, so my bottom line was, when CDs came out here, the client wants 10 dB of more bottom, I can do it. The yeah. client wants more brightness and, and uh, better high end, I can do it. I, I, what, what, what I put in that record, and finally my skills are being like appreciated. And it's like, wow, I can really go, I, I can, 
I can I can put the pedal to the So metal. you loved it. It, it was, was like, like a, a great it changed my life. It was like, oh fuck, I make CDs, even though those first CD systems, those 1610s, 1630s, they were they sounded the converters were pretty pretty okay. Well, I felt you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I felt one of the one of the downsides initially yeah. is that people weren't remastering for CD. They were taking masters that were created oh, for vinyl. Course. Well, they did that in the beginning because CDs for I know this for a fact, CDs came out and they needed to supply masters immediately. They, they wasn't, they didn't have time to remaster everything, book studio time, get engineers to start again and, and pay for all this when they could just basically to take the, 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 what they called the EQ'd master, which is a, a 15 IPS, usually a Dolby copy, and just transfer it to digital and, and let, it, let it fly. And as we all know, I don't know if you know anything about noise reduction systems, they really, really smear the sound, especially the Dolby. Dolby A is just the worst. I don't know. They've just figured it out because they, you know, they had a system that kind of removed some tape hiss, but also removed all the transients, all the, all the guts out of it, all the sparkle, all the you know, fancy stuff. But we, nobody knew any better. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm also old school, but I, um, I, I understand where the origins come from rather and where we are now. So it, it's, it's like you have a really good you know, I, idea of what, what, what perfect sound is. And, and, and to be honest with you, the, the noise reduction systems got better when Dolby SR, I don't know if you remember that. Of course, S and SR, I remember well. Yeah. SR was like, oh shit, and, and it, it had a sound. And I knew a lot of famous producers that would mix like the analog tape 15 IPS on the half inch, and they would use SR, and man, it was beautiful. And it was, it, to me, that was the perfect analog. I remember right at the end, you had the Studer Golds. Remember the uh, oh, of uh, course. 827 Golds with the yeah. SR was like. Yeah, well, I, I have an old 80, but the, those were nice. I have an A80 as well. Yeah, I have one of the old ones there, but it's, they sound fantastic. Yeah, they do. I, I, I mixed a record uh, a couple of years ago off, off my 80, transferred to Pro Tools, and uh, I had a new assistant, and he's yeah. like, I think there's a problem with the, <laughs> with the session. I'm like, what is it? And he soloed the track and he's like, there's a noise on it. <laughs> Fuck, the noise is like part of the tapist. sound, man. I mean, you know, he's never worked off tape. Well, the, 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 <laughs> you know, the whole thing is, but he never heard bottom end that sounded so full. And he never heard, you know, the, uh, the top end that sounded so smooth. And, you know, anytime you convert anything to digital, there's a conversion. I mean, I have the most expensive converters on the planet, but I still hear the difference. I mean, it, it's subtle now. I mean, this is 2017, so we figured this all out. And even crappy sounding converters sound good. But I, I know what you're saying. In the old days, it just... Uh, it, it, it's it, just funny because, you know, kids aren't growing up with tape, so it's all new well, to Well, I mean, a reel of tape now is 100 bucks. And I, I get Maybe tape... Maybe more. I, I get tape... Oh, a you lot. mean for a, two, for a, for a half for, inch? Yeah, for a half yeah. inch with a two-track, two-inch tape. Uh, it's probably like 400 bucks. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, but I, I know a lot of famous producers that love tape because the artists have to commit. That's, that's, that's That was the whole thing is you got a reel of tape that costs 400 bucks and you got 8 to 12 songs here. And, you know, reel of tape, if you're going at 30 ifs, you know, it's one song on a reel of tape. And then that, and that's only one or two versions. What if you have vocal ups and guitar ups and vocal downs and all that? And, and, and what if you use them? So you got to print everything. So th this, uh, I know a lot of very well-known producers that will just go to tape, just so the artist will commit to something. No, it's it's, it's done. We can't do it any. We can't. We, uh, we, uh. And it's performance-based. You have to come in and listen and of go. Course. Okay, I need to. I need to fit in with the kick better. I need to but, do this. Yeah. But that's just recording. Okay. Yeah. I mean the. So for you, so we go on CD now. Well, CDs. Well, when they when they came out, they were like, you know, it, it's finally you know somebody can really appreciate what I've done. That's I great. Mean, it's like all of a sudden, uh, you're in the studio now. You're hearing kind of what I'm hearing, rather than it was always a secret what went on in, you know, in, 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 in the black arts. And the, the black arts and mm -hmm. the, what, what it was like mixing, recording, mastering, you know, the whole thing. Now all of a sudden you're let in. I would imagine like going back, once it started moving, going back to old albums and mastering for CD must have been huge. Oh, are you kidding me? It was huge. It was, wasn't the word, you know. It was, yeah. 
I still remember that one of my best friends um, did one of the first digital records, Madonna, that, that like, a, like a Virgin, yep. was one of the first digitally recorded albums. And one of my best friends, Jason Cassaro, I don't know if you know him, engineered and mixed it. And they did it in a very famous studio in New York, and they recorded everything. Everything was recorded on that, uh, the 3324, that digital multi-track, and they mixed it down. There was a, remember, I don't know if you remember, these, there was a, it was a unit called the PCM F1. I don't remember that. I remember the 33. Yeah. But it, there was like a two-track machine that was, that was, that was um, video-based. So everything got stored on there. And it sounded, it, eh, but it was digital. I mean, before that, there was, this was, I'm talking like mid-8, you know, there was no two-track digital recorders. Zappa used to record onto video cassettes in the 70s. Yeah, that's what the people did, onto video cassettes. So I remember one day, I, I wasn't working on the record, but my old boss, Bob Ludwig, was working on it. And uh, they came in and did the record, and I walked in the studio, and I, I, I knew my jaw dropped. I, holy shit, this sounds fucking great. Even though that had no bottom, it just, it had a certain presence, and, and it went on to sell like 30 million records, but... Um, it like just, a version, yeah, huge. But it was like it, it was it was like hearing the music for the first time. It was like, wow! Just imagine what you can do, with, you know, if you refine this. And it's, it, it's interesting, isn't it, how technology dictates how, our music entirely? Because you know course. the fact that you couldn't get those forty or sixty hertz on a kick drum. Exactly. Meant everybody shelved their kick drums at like eighty, and of now course. everybody's shelving their kick drum between forty and sixty to get like low lows <laughs> yeah. because you can. Well, the point being is now whatever you put in. You get back, okay, and it, it does. It does kind of breed overkill a bit, but the good news is you listen back. Oh, I don't like it. You take it down, and you, it, it's easy. You just push another button, and you can do different takes. But um, okay, so I have to ask this question because people are going to ask this question anyway. So uh, you're like you're listening to hundreds of records to every mixer or engineer's producer's record. Uh -huh. You know, we're making. I work a lot, but it's probably still 20 or 30 albums a year. Yeah. Maybe 30 plus albums a year. Yeah. You, on the other hand, might work on 30 records a month. Oh, yeah, I probably do. Somewhere. Yeah. So if you do one album hundred. a day, that's 30 records a month. Yeah. So, so you hear a lot of stuff. Now, yeah. <laughs> really, for you, are you feeling are you feeling the difference between MP3s and Waves? Are you feel, what about Master for iTunes? What are your sort of theories on um, those things? You know, my theory is if it's, if it's well recorded, mm -hmm. Well mixed, well mastered. No matter what format it comes out in, it will sound good. Great. It'll sound good on a shitty MP3. It'll sound good on a 24-bit, you know, super file. It'll sound good on a, a, a master for iTunes. I, I, I mean, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I, I didn't embrace this. I, I got, I, about two months ago, I decided I'm gonna fucking get Spotify. You know, I'm just I'm in the car listening to CDs, and I was like, I, I don't, ah, too much. And it's all MP3 quality. And I put it on, and I listen to some of these records I've done years and years, and I put them on, and they sound good. It sounds fine. I like Spotify because I love access. Exactly. I'm, I'm a musical junkie like you. I just need to yeah. hear music. I want to and hear then all a song. of a sudden, my life, my life changed. I tried to, you know, because I think that kind of, the formats like that are, they're not good for, the, for artists in general because they, um, they, they they don't really they're not making the money they should but that that's the new way. It's good of, for independent artists because they keep one hundred percent of the money. Yeah, they do. And look, it gets it gets things out there. There's nothing wrong with any of this. Okay, it's all good, good, good. If you make, and and the point being is, if you make a great record, if you nobody is somebody, if you had a tremendous product, somebody will find it. We like to think so, but it, it's, you know, like I say, um, I think skills have gotten really well. Well, um, uh, uh, there are artists now, there's engineers now that I, uh, somebody sends me stuff and I called the producer, I'm like, who's the guy who mixed that? It sounded amazing. And, oh, and, and the guy calls me, oh my God, you, you know, he, he was like, that's such a, you know, it's an honor to say you did. And I'll be honest, I'll, I'll tell somebody, you know, if, you know, if it's a young engineer or a young producer brings me something that just sounds fantastic. And, and that's wonderful. And you know, right nowadays, every the playing field is kind of leveled with equipment. Absolutely, everybody's using a lot of the same gear, a lot of the same plugins, a lot of the same converters, and everything. So it's it's come down to more skills and and abilities. And 
That's what it's all about, isn't the end, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's all about the creativity. Because yeah. for years ago, I remember there were people go, I got this piece of gear and that piece of gear. Oh, you wouldn't believe this console I got. It's got 90,000 inputs and it's got faders on everything, compressors on. And then I, and I swear to God, this, this happened more than once. And then the guy would give me, send me something, or I, he would play me something that was done on this super duper system. And it didn't sound that good. Yep. <laughs> and rather some kid who's making a record in his fucking bedroom, I put it on and I said, wow, this is great. So, like I said, equipment is really, really important, but it's not the be all and end all. No, not at all. I think, well, plus, it's really unless important. you're recording a band live, yeah. one nice mic pre with one nice condenser. Absolutely. Off you go. Absolutely. fucking lutely And more than anything else, I find a, 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 the equipment really is secondary, I think. I mean, a, a, you know, like everybody's going to have decent gear. You know, so it, it's more more of the skills, the recording skills, and it, it's the mixing skills, it's the playing, it's the it's the amps, it's everything that goes into it. So um, th those days are over, and that's why you can make records these days fairly cheap that are tremendous quality, and then people are doing that. Absolutely, that's why they hire me to make sure they they end up that way. Yeah, I think uh, I think the job of a mastering engineer is becoming even more important. Are you kidding me? It's like crucial. And yeah, because I'm like, if I'm a, a, a guy now, I'm especially me. I'm like co-writing the song. I'm yeah. playing <laughs> on the song. I'm engineering yeah. the song. I'm producing or mix. I'm doing eight different things. You are. And then if I don't have somebody at the end going, eh. but I, I really the, the good news is I really appreciate what you do. I mean, I, the the main thing what I try to do is when I I, I deal with an artist or producer or an engineer, um, just find right away. You know, feel them out. You know, is there any gray area? Do you love the mix? Do you love what you did? Are, are we, uh, do we? Do we need to get heavy-handed on this stuff? Uh, you know, it, it's very important to get comments, obviously, what I do on everything. You know, oh, I like it. I like the bottom really big. I like it really bright. I like this. Or they just say, I don't know, just do whatever you want. So it, it's always good to have a, um, to keep everybody involved because it, it eliminates recalls and, and, and clients getting disappointed when they want something and they don't. Right. So I'm a very big a thing on, um, on on keeping involved, getting involved, you know, yes. keeping lines of communication. No, I open. think it's really important because as, as a guy like me, and there's probably a million of me running around the world, <laughs> you know, a lot of them, but you're, doing you're, a lot of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, but with that many people, they need somebody to come to and say, if this and, isn't and, good, tell me why. Well, I, you know, the, the, the thing is, I, I've learned my lesson over the years, you have to, you have to pick and choose who you, uh, what you, um, the 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 uh, um, advice you see, your advice you give yeah. because they, you know. Um, so I, generally speaking, it's always on a positive end. If something sounds bad, I'll I'll just say, well, let me hear another mix or something. Don't take oh you that mix just had no bottom, the top was muffled. Is you know. I understand where you're going. It makes sense because if you find another mix on the album, which is fantastic, you can go. Well, that's what did you do on that? Yeah. Take that, what you did yeah. on that, and apply it to this other one. Well, don't one forget, go, yeah. nowadays it's... Um, it's about encouragement, I agree. Yeah, and you, you could have one record that has have five different engineers on, and six oh, yeah. engineers on there. And how do, you, how do you make this thing feel like one album? But, hey, guess yeah. what? Th that's not the way the, the industry is anymore. It's a singles industry. And I, what I try to do is just make every track sound good on its own. Sure. Okay? And if, it, if it's a... If it's if somebody's doing something like would you like to consider like a classic record where it's an album, th then you try to make everything really coherent, make everything you just feel like when you push play from you know from zero to like twenty five and thirty minutes, you know you're feeling one nice flow. Wonderful. You know, and that's what I grew up on. But that doesn't mean I don't I don't embrace um, records that. That that every song sounds different, and I've done so many of those, and I have to be honest with you, sometimes that that gets me really more interested in the record. Cause sure. Sometimes you put a record on uh, or, or, or a recording on that everything sounds exactly the same. So what happens is you might as well you hear the well, first I think two of, songs. Think of Revolver. Okay. I mean, it's considered to be one of the greatest albums of all time, if not the greatest album. I mean, it's what's one the genre? Of Excuse me. Is, it's what's the genre? You've got like. Got to get you into my life with just a horn section. Of you've got course. Eleanor Rigby with just a string section. Of course. You've got Taxman, which sounds like indie rock. Yeah. 
Tomorrow Never Knows, Backwards Tape Loops. I mean... Yeah, I mean, that's that's just one of them, but there's yeah. thousands of examples yeah. like that. And yeah. that that's what keeps a listener interested. Yep. Because, you know, otherwise they're just pushing the button, next one, next All right, one. All right, now we're on the subject of albums. Okay. <laughs> what has been your favorites? Oh, that's a that's a rough one. I know you don't want to single out anybody, but there must be something that you were just like, wow, something that made your hair stand on. Well, that was like it. in the old days, the Run DMC, when I did that thing where they always walked this way, that was an amazing record. Oh, you did that? Beastie. I did all those. Why did I not know that? I had I the worked platinum with Aerosmith. record sitting right out there. I worked with Aerosmith. So. Um, all the, they were they showed up and they all the guys showed up. That was one of them and the Beastie Boys. Um, um, I did all these big Which Beastie Boys. I did every one of them. No I communication, did Paul's communication, Paul's boutique. Those were amazing albums. Um, oh. yeah, yeah. And I knew those guys. I mean, they're, they're all they, they also live right near me, and I they were they were friends. So, I mean, do I have any favorites? Maybe. I I can't really pinpoint one. Like, you know, the, there was some, some hip-hop records that were pretty amazing in the old days. Public Enemy, LL Cool J, Run DMC, um, uh, De La Soul. I mean, there was just so many of them. But I, and, and, and some of the big, and, and then all of a sudden, like the late 80s, I just did every punk record on the business. Ramones, you know, Talking Heads, you know. Fantastic. All of those. And then I go in phases, and then I did all the alternative records, the Nirvanas, the Smashing Pumpkins, the... You know, the Pixies and all those records. So I, I believe I, I, do. I believe every genre has its favorites. And if I can narrow down one, I don't think so. But I, I can, I can, get, I have a good list of of favorites. But I, for me, it's all about. Um, I mean, not not as many current records as I've heard. Is more like late nineties, nineties. I think the nineties. I mean, I'm not trying to sound dated, but if you go back, there was some uh, some some albums there that just just could never be beat today. Is there something you can think of? Um, that Nevermind Nirvana, mm -hmm. um, some Chili Peppers records, um, um, some Prince records. Some, I mean, just a, a genre of music that I, I don't know. Something was about the '90s, and just one great album after another, and. And not to not to say there's not, but the the the, the and I I did this uh, whole class on classic records at one point. I couldn't find any in the last five years that I would consider a classic record like I like in the mid '80s to late '80s and '90s classic records. That doesn't mean they weren't really good, but you know I what I consider a classic record is something that that ten years from now you put it you play it and it just still sounds current. I'm sure you've had a few of those. You've probably worked on a few of those. There's things I've loved, yes. Yeah. And what's some of your favorite recordings? We're not going <laughs> to... Um, I, I always come back to one song off of one album. It's the second Frey album and the song we, we were listening to in the car the other day. I did it's a called Frey a, album. Um, which yeah. one did you do? The one Stuart Price did. Oh, after I, I... I did the first two albums. Okay. They're a good band. Really They're tremendous great band. band. There's a song called Enough For Now off the second album, uh -huh. which I have I'll a check massive it out. emotional connection with. Okay, well, the, the Bob Mustard and yeah. um, Michael Brown mixed. Well, he's Michael's a great engineer. Yeah, so that's that's that. I have a strong emotional connection, and I put a lot of love into that. That's song. good. Well, you should. And so you know how sometimes you just something connects with you, and yeah, I, I've I've done a lot of that. You know, a lot of these those little pump smashing pumpkins records, all those punk records, all those Seattle bands, you know, uh, Pearl Jam. I did a bunch of their records, Soundgarden. Um, you know all that stuff, and and even the you know, even the heavy metal records and the and the classic rock. I mean, the thing I like about it is I can go back to any genre of music and I can find something that's oh shit you did that and this one and the the heavy metal records I did all those Slayer records, Metallica, you know all the Pantera records. I mean, amazing. It, it is pretty good. You know, some days I get up and go hmm, you know, but what have I done lately? You know. And like I said, right now, um, my skills are to just taking, you know, knowing, knowing at any point in time, if, if I get a recording, I know in, in, in after one listen, if it's perfect or what button to push, what not to push and, and, and to, you know, to make it, you know, to make it presentable, not, not even presentable. I, I, I like somebody to, when they push play or whatever it is, they want to feel some kind of magic. Sure. I agree. No, I, I, I used to have this big button 
a big sign right in front of me, just magic, you know. Mm -hmm. Every time I would like think it wasn't, you know, what I mastered wasn't perfect, I'd go back and is it magical? And then, and then, and then I it was just it was just a, a an awareness, okay. I agree. And and I think that's what's missing in a lot of a lot of music these days, and a, a lot of engineers and producers don't go for certain magic. Well, Makes I do. Sense. And like I said, um, and it doesn't matter if you hit thirty buttons or you hit two buttons. Uh, it's it's all really matters is the end results. It's all about it's all about results and the skills. So let's do a quick uh, couple of minutes and just take a tour of uh, your sure. studio here. Okay. So these are old, these KLKs, aren't they? What's that? These are the, these are quite these old. These are the first ones. First ones they have made. Focal drivers. Oh wow! So these are actually Focal speakers. They have dual coil. Uh, the square ones, they, they were the first ones they made. Great. Basically, the guy who, this KRK dude, took the, those drivers there were the best kits ever made. Well, Focal made them. They never made speakers. They, they never made systems. They just made... Just the drivers. Drivers. Yeah. This was considered the best driver on the mark because they have dual coils. So it, it sounds almost bi amped when it's not. This one. And the same as the the tweeters are all Kevlar tweeters, Kevlar woofers. So they um um yeah, I'll show you. Right. I love this. Huh? This is a really smart idea. So you get your you get your clients to come in, well, they yeah. get to listen they the way they're used there. to, yeah. And the NS10 is really, I mean, check it out, and especially... That nice, sounds huh? fantastic, yeah. And I found a set that they're almost brand, brand fucking new. And they look brand new, I've never and seen they, them. And I'm keeping them that way. Because you can't find... These no things scratch. go for like two grand a pair now. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah? Yeah, it's getting but so these expensive. But these still... That was pretty Who good. Who makes this? Rich. Rich Costi. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, Rich is, yeah. I've known him when he was an assistant. Huh? When he lived out here and he moved to New York, I got him an apartment in my building. You know? I've known him for years. He, he's pretty good. You know? He's amazing. He's a, he's a character. If he's you, eclectic. You know, what's that? He's eclectic. He works on everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think he of does, him. Yeah, he does pretty heavy stuff too. You know, yeah. but, um, um, now you got. So he's I very love dedicated. This, huh? So I love this idea. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a 1032, so I got 1031s as well. I grew up on NS10s, like all of us. Of course. Um, so I love this idea. So you have the client can sit here. Oh yeah, I, I you know, and the, these near fields, they're exactly what they're a near field. I, I don't like speakers on top of me. This probably saves you a lot of work because there's so many times I've left mastering studios having no idea what it really sounds like. See, that's like. why you should just hang out with me and. And then and I go back to my studio and, easy, and I listen yeah? to my Gen and go, oh, you can have lunch here. You can pick your kids up from school. Yeah. You know? There you go. Yeah. But whatever. <laughs> that's, you know, look, I like you so. You're in my circle, you're good, yeah? This is great. Tell me about this PMC. This is one. These are the, they're, they're, they're basically, they're, they're gigantors. Rich turned me on, Costi turned me on to these. He had them. They're basically, um. He's mixing through these? He has a set of these, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I never was a big fan. I used to have big horn-loaded systems, Altex and and horns and big, see the, the subwoofers are in the corner, my old subs. Did you have like Allsburgers before? No, they were Altec versions, um, 19s, and you know, see those Altec 19s, those big. Probably if I saw it. They're, they're big yeah. 15 and a big horn. Yeah, I've seen them, yeah. And, I, and they don't have a lot of bottom end, so I, I used to, I, I used those, those are 25 inch subs in the corner. Oh, those big Hartleys? Yeah. Oh yeah, those are huge. So I used to use those as subs. Yep. And the, those horn systems, they, you know, whatever. They sounded great, and I, that's what I did all my, uh, some of the biggest records I ever worked on were in, in New York on those big horn systems. But and when I came out here, I, you know, the PMC came over and said, yeah, just let me hook them up for you. And then they disappeared. The, the comp, you know, you know I, I know their spiel. There's, they leave them here, and then like three months <laughs> later, they show up and goes, well, somebody else wants them. You can buy them if you want. I'll give you a great deal. Yeah. So I've of course already, you buy them. I've already gotten used to them. The clients <laughs> loved them, and I was very happy with them. And, and, and to be honest with you, it made listening to music that much. The rep is a great guy. What's that, The Maurice? rep's a great yeah. guy, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about some gear here. This is interesting. So you've got the Focusrite Red up here. Yeah, I love that. I had the original one. Yeah. The, the original, um, there was only five of them ever made. I had it in New York. It was a... Um, 
the prototype for that. Yep. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Remember the first Focus Right consoles they ever made? Of course. It was a center section, yep. a center compressor. They only made, literally, it was a stereo compressor. Every other one they made was dual mono. Oh, wow. So I, I got it through that mercenary audio. Remember those guys? I do remember those guys. He yeah. wouldn't sell it to me. So <laughs> finally, finally, I, I, you know, he lent it to me. He said, oh, I'm not selling this. This is the best piece of gear I've ever owned. So finally, I came up with a bunch of money, and then we, the studio bought it from him. Oh, and wow. the thing was put together like chewing gum, but it had sounded like nothing else. <laughs> you know? so, um, so when I left there, I basically got this, which was kind of a prototype of that. These reds were like the stereo compressors. They're good. I, I, I use them more just for the line amps. They, they have a certain um, gluey sound to them. When you put the, you know, when you put it on, um, when you use actually the compressor mode, it, get, it gets a little, you know, compressy. But if I use it just in the, um, uh, the key mode, where you're just going through the system and you're just gaining it up, it does yep. something really nice. Very nice. And then this one, is that this, an SSL? One, this is one of the, the most famous uh, techs in LA built this custom. Who? Tom Dowdy, you know Tom? In Paramount, he has that. Oh, right. So when, uh, when uh, they were, you know, I bought a bunch of gear from him and um, um, he, 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 I made him sell me this thing. This is one of the best fucking comp stereo compressors I've ever, it sounds like an SSL, just a lot better. Yeah. And it, this is only a, a controller. The whole thing is this big. Oh, it is? Yeah. <laughs> controller, I mean, it's all down there, but that, that's, uh, it's, it's big. Right. And, that's, and then this I, L2, which I like, it, it, it gives you some kind of push. Very, you know, very unobtrusive, very easy, you know. And this is the Massenburg version of the Sontech. The, that's um, the one that's more like Vibe, uh, which is great. It has a... It's a very like vibey, um, um, wide sound to it. Where this one is just basically um, um, your Swiss Army knife. It does everything. It's it's the it's the most. If I would, it, this is the most perfect piece of gear ever made. It just you love like it. Five bands. Everyone. It's fully parametric. It sounds amazing. You can do anything with it, and it's clean and it's quiet, and you can get heavy with it or just light with it. You know. Wonderful. Just, you know, like I said, just going through the... Um, Have you been line. using the Sontech for years? Yeah, I, I, I had the original version of this for mastering, but this was a four-channel unit. These, these are just twos. And, uh, you know, for disc cutting, you, you need four channels. You need two preview channels and, you, you know, when, the, you know, cutting lathe, um, uh, the computer has to see exactly what the cutter head sees. So, you have to have four channels. So basically, this was uh, the, the original one of this had four channels in it. That's amazing. So I, I, I got to use this. And this is one of those old Weiss. This is the original Weiss um, um, digital EQ and compressor. Pretty pretty good, you know? Are you still using it? I use it once in a while. I use it for, this This only goes uh, 24, 40, 48. So anything that, that way. But the plugins have gotten so good. I, I still love the sound. This has an amazing sound. It's Swiss. Yeah. We love the Swiss. Oh well, yeah, and then this Precision. SPL, this front end is basically it's a 120 volt console. That means it, it has the the most headroom of any analog. I mean, most analog consoles are 60 volts. So this is, is 120 volt power supply, 120 volt rails, and it just the, the the amount of headroom here is is frightening. Great. I mean, it's pretty much digital sound, but it's analog. You know? Wonderful. And, it, and it's just a front end. It just you know you can level in and out. And, you know, you know, speaker selectors and controllers anywhere, you know. You know. And they can uh, you know. Oh, wow. That's you know. The monitor. This is monitor and this is actually when you're recording. This is, you know, this is actually what goes in it. It's very good to check things Great. in mono. I always do. Wonderful. If if you take something out if you put something out of phase in mono, it should be a straight line. If it's not you know, and I, I do everything. Uh, it, sh it should it shouldn't disappear. That, that's it. That's like a a good recording. Yeah. Oh, this is just monitoring. Yeah, that's 
It's crazy, cool. quite dizzying, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Listening to Faze like that, whoa. Yeah, the Faze shit is really, I, I like it right in my face. I don't like that, I like this, you know? Yeah. You know? I mean, I like that for, for certain things, for movies, you know, for, for visuals, but for music, I like it, I like it coming at me. Coming at you, right? Yeah. So what do we have up here? I have these, these old DCS converters. These are the 90s, these are the holy grail. I did thousands of records. When I moved down here, I finally, um, these, these, these converters, when they came out, um, were the, the, in the 90s, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s. They were the first ones to do DSD and first ones to do 2496. And they just have the biggest bottom end and the, the most smoothest mid-range and the smoothest top end of any converter. But it doesn't work for everything. That's why I, um, I, I can flip back and forth between these. I have these antelope ones. This is, those are pretty much um, this. That, that's an amazing converter. I monitor everything off of there and I capture everything off of there. Because when I capture something, I just want to capture it exactly as I hear it. I, I don't want sound. And I have one of these MyTex, which I use as well. These guys down here, this, this is fantastic. Have you ever tried this thing? No, but I hear wonderful things about it. Oh my God, it. it's brilliant. This little mic so I use that for playback. It's really good. You should call them the guy, they're fantastic. Wonderful. And everything is clocked through like a $5,000 um, uh, atomic front end. Wonderful. So this basically, I mean, it's, it's frightening how, when you, when you take the clock out, when, when I, I do tests a lot of times, I'll, I'll show them what, the, what they're using and what this, what this clock sounds like. It's night and day. Have wow. you ever done any of those tests? I've never done you direct comparisons. flip out. Really? Yeah. I mean, I could, I could show you something, but... Um, we should come back and do that. We'll do yeah. it. Why don't we do it's, an actual it's video? It's frightening. Like frightening. And then this is, the, this is basically the oven and this is the front end. You can do three different sample rates at once. And it's nice. So I, I capture everything in 96. This is, plays back at 44.1 and 42.93. That's just an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use that one. And then I, like I said, I capture on these things and there's my Pro Tools front end. And then I have the, the full blown merging system. I have every, basically every plugin on the planet in here. I got all, these, these are the proprietary ones. This is the one, this is the merging amazing EQ and they got compressors in here and I have a, all the slates plugins as well and these days you're doing everything in a hybrid fashion so you are you uh, doing detail what work I like on this? to do is I, I like to sometimes just bypass everything just give it an analog front end and do all my tweaking through this because it's so it, it's just so perfect and I, I already it's a, I already got the sound I want now I just want to sculpt it a bit you know just you know make something a little brighter we give Take all, you know, and, I, and you can do it in even incre in, increments of uh, quarter dB. Yeah. And then I have all the all the slates plugins I got, it. and I I use this thing a lot too. By the way, this I developed with Steven. Have you ever used this thing? I'm just about to. Oh my God! Well, just that, about to get right in into that world. Well, that is that tape machine. Oh, what is that tape machine? That's the, the two the two the this one the half inch two track is, is modeled off of this Studer A A oh, wow. R C. This is, I've used a lot of Studers. I've used the A20s, the A80s, the 800s. This, this is a transformer machine that just fucking rocks. It's That's solid bottom. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's got really good, uh, good width. It's got great mid range. So basically, Steven modeled that off of, there's two versions. Yeah, he modeled a, um, the Studer with transformers and one without. And this is the one with it. And I use it. I, I'll be honest with you. I use that on a lot of projects. And clients go to me, what the fuck did you do? How do you get the bottom to sound like that? And I start laughing. That is one of the, probably one of his best plugins he's ever made. That's amazing. That's and great it to really know. does sound like tape. And you could put hiss on it. <laughs> I'm surprised you've never seen this. You see, I have, but I haven't used it yet. I'm oh just about God, to. I'm amazing. just about to use it with, uh, with a mix. It might actually. And if you get it going, I can show you the best. I, 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 I like it. All, all I do is just nick it. Don't have these meters go too far. Right. Because then, then you start getting into compression and stuff. Just, you just want to kind of nick it. Yeah. And I, I, you know, and try either the, um, you know, either the, um, 
The two inch 16 has, is transformerless and the half inch two is with transformers. So the, the half inch two stat machine, you get a bigger bottom. Right, fantastic. And the other, on the other one, you, you get, you can even do that like this, you see? It's all touch screen. Oh, you got your Raven. Yeah, <laughs> and um, um, either way, but it, it's all taste. Wonderful. And um, I, I like the 30 IPS setting because I've always liked 30 IPS. I, I, I liked it for tape, it just, it, it, you know. You like the detail on the high end? And the detail is really yeah. good. Yeah. And to me, that's like the perfect sound. I always liked printing bass and drums of 15 of course. for the bump. For the low That's the old story, yeah. And it works. I remember years ago they they had a couple of machines out there with two inch eight tracks. Do you remember those? Yep. What's his name had one? Michael Beinhorn had one. A few people had one. That's some wide tape. It's with pretty that. pretty crazy. Yep. And then I've used also the one inch two tracks. That's overkill. Have you ever tried one of those? I haven't. There's only a handful of those machines out there. I Ampex think, made it. I think we printed maybe once or twice to those. I feel like They're Dave really, Jordan had one. Dave had one. Um, a few guys had them. They're, they're, I mean, they're, I think it's overkill. I, I did a lot of A-B tests between that and half inch. I didn't hear a, a world of difference. I, I, it sounded a little more solid, a little bit nicer, but not enough where, you know, where the, the pain in the ass of getting a machine and renting it and, mm -hmm. and doing it. You know, it it's, you know, if, if you have everything in the world, yes. Get sure. It, you know? But if you if you're working on a budget and you're and you, you know other things are important, use that money on something more important. Sure. You know, like you know, like better food or something. <laughs> <laughs> better front end. Yes, exactly. Better plugins or something. Howie, <laughs> thank you ever so much. Warren, that was a lot of fun. Your 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 talents uh, exceed what I expected. That's more than true <laughs> of you. Although you you know you you got a resume as long as. Uh, 800 people's arms, let alone mine. Well, you know, it's, it's you know, and, and I appreciate people noticing that because that's what really you do this for. Absolutely. I mean, we get into this business, you know, number one, because we love music, and number two, we love people that play music, and we, we love, you know, doing some great work and actually people, you know, actually noticing it and hearing yeah. it. I mean, there, there's times where literally one time on the radio, there's, eight, there's seven or eight songs in a row that I've worked on, and I'm like, Shit, I know that song. I know that one. I know that. Holy shit. Somebody was in there, they wouldn't believe it. And I showed them the credits. I go, oh, you're fucking crazy. So what it's I'm saying. It's a wonderful is, feeling. It's it's the best. And I've won a, you know, Grammys and all kinds of dumb awards, whatever it is. But it's you know, it's just part of the you know, just part of, you know, being, you know, a creative Absolutely. and, and uh, um, you know We're a, blessed to be able to do this for a living. I know, I do stuff that, I mean, what I do for a living is what people do for fun. Yeah, that's but, a good line, I like that. But you have, you know, we have fun doing it, and, and, and the people we work with are, 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 are pieces of work, a lot of them, and a lot of them are really unique individuals. Yeah, well, we're, um, bl we're blessed, I mean, just to, God, I don't know about you, but if I was a little kid and I was yeah. thinking about what the life I've had so far, I'd be quite yeah. happy. I, me too, but... Like I said, I, I, you know, I started doing this in the 80s when I was really, really young. And it's 2017 and I, I'm still doing the same thing. It's wonderful. Just on a different level. Wonderful. And now I, I do whatever I want, whatever I want. But I keep busy, so I'm happy. Absolutely. Well, right. thanks ever so much. Of course, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I'll yeah. see if I can ask Howie them. And we'll do some more soon. And absolutely. And uh, yeah, I'm all good for that, okay? Wonderful. Well, thanks Spread ever so much. Word. Warren, you're a man. You're, You're the man. There. Okay. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Share, like. Anything all that good you stuff. please, okay? Okay, he, he said it. Do your thing. <laughs>